Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements' in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. The Lord can use you with whatever inadequacy there is in your life. And if he can't, he could never have used one of the humans that he did throughout the whole Bible. You read some of the instances in the Bible of men that the Lord chose, set apart, used, and they still had issues in their life. Not only did they come with issues, they still had them in their life. Moses had an issue. He, was, he lacked any self-confidence whatsoever. Uh, and he seemed to get over that somewhat, not ever totally. But he also had a temper. And the Lord knew that before he called him. And the Lord knew that the whole time he used him. And when he took that rod and smacked that rock because he was mad at people, they're just lucky he didn't start smacking them. Because the Egyptian, 40 years earlier, he killed him. When he saw something that wasn't right, when he came down, he took those tablets and smashed them on the ground. That wasn't the will of God. But the Lord continued to use him. The Lord continued to use Peter. It amazes us. Through all of his yapping and opening his mouth and saying the wrong things. Through his denial. If you don't think the Lord can use you because there's one area of your life that you don't have it together in, you'll never be used. If you don't think you're prayers can be answered if you don't think your worship ascends to heaven and is received, if if you don't think there's a place for you in the kingdom of God in His service because you're so aware of, of some fault, some inadequacy, some weakness in your life, you'll never serve Him. You'll never get to the, to, to the place where everything is perfect. Never. You have to forge through those things. And and, and by the way, that's most likely an evil spirit that continues to bombard you with, well, God can't use you, and God doesn't hear you, and and, and you're not going to, that's that's most likely you've got spiritual help to feel like you're not good enough. Look at yourself through the mirror of God's Word. See what it says about you. Not what the world says about you, not what your family says about you, not what your friends say about you, not what the devil says about you. Believe what the Bible says. There's a confession that that my pastor makes in in, in their church uh, every time he preaches, holds up his Bible, says, this is my Bible. I am who it says I am, and I believe my Bible. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the devil says. I don't care what my circumstances say. I only care what the Bible says. And that's what I believe. And that's what I believe. Amen. Amen. Uh, I was thinking about that plane, uh, about that plane trip uh, uh, home. I'm off that now. Uh, I, hope, I hope that was helpful to you. <clears throat> and uh, don't take this the wrong way. Just don't take this the wrong way. I didn't even think about it. You know, I wasn't sitting in that seat going... <laughs> but uh, I left San Juan, Puerto Rico at 6 o'clock in the morning. was on the plane at 20 minutes before. Set my watch because it was 8 there. Landed in Chicago at 11.27. That's five and a half hours. 
How many? And never left my seat. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm just saying I sat in, sat in the same chair for five and a half hours and never moved. Just saying. I'm, I'm just saying. Why? <clears throat> because nobody's moving, and I thought that would be a good time to say it. <laughs> Dr. Roy Hicks was here uh, in our church. He actually was here, I believe, five times he came and preached to us. Greatest theologian that's lived on the planet during our lifetime. And he asked me a challenging question after he preached. He said, how many people do you think were moving around during your service? I didn't know, because I sit in the front and I never see it. He told me, he had counted 47 people in one service, got up and moved around. You can't be receiving when you're doing that. And, and <clears throat> see, I haven't, I haven't pastored much along this line recently, have I? So might as well do it now. Amen. There are things you can do, like, like tickling your fiance back of her neck. You, you, you oughtn't to do that in church. You oughtn't to do that. That's distracting. Okay? All, all, of, the, all of the lovers are going. And there's, a, there's a time and a place for everything. I didn't say it's wrong. I just said it was distracting. You let your children talk to you during the, during the worship time or during the pastoring time or during the preaching time. That's distracting. If you want a good lesson in parenting, talk to either one of our children about how they behaved when we were worshiping the Lord or when something was happening in the pulpit. They paid attention. Not all the time. Sometimes they needed assistance. That's right. and, and, they, and, they, and they received it. Yep. And they received it. But we had family time where we talked to them and said, now, when we're in the car, the gloves come off. When, when we're at the park, there, there's no run, laugh, scream, shout. But when we're in God's house, and we would teach them. We would teach them how we behave ourselves in the house of God. Pastor, you're going overboard. No, no, I got that from the Bible. I got that right out of the Bible. Yeah, the second to the last verse in 1 Timothy chapter 3 says, so that you may know how to behave yourself in the house of God. And one of the biggest responsibilities we have is not to be distracting to those around us. Some people ask, Don't your, doesn't your church believe in dancing? And the Bible says, worship the Lord in the dance. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you have ever seen me dance before the Lord? See, I don't do it in front of everybody where it would be distracting. I can do it in private. That I, you don't, you don't ever, ever, ever see it. Right. Or, or what we ask is if, if, if you're going to dance, I mean, other than the, the, the little, you know, crow hop. <laughs> you know, or, you know the, they used to call it down south. Your son goes to Bible school down there. They called it the Tulsa two-step. But when you have to have, you know, all of your, your streamers and your lights and, and, and all of that stuff, and you got to be out in front of everybody, number one, you're doing it to be seen. Or you wouldn't care. It's all right. You, you, you smile. I love you. So, so why not go back in a corner? We've got several ladies here. One, two, three, four that I'm thinking of right now. And you never even know. But they dance before the Lord while you're worshiping God. They're not trying to get your attention. They're not dancing for you. They don't care about you. They're dancing before the Lord that made them and the, and the one that redeemed them. And that's all they care about. Very decently. Very decently that, 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 that they do. But to be a distraction... That's why there's a whole chapter in our Bible, 1 Corinthians 14. You don't care if I pastor for a little bit here? Okay, 1 Corinthians 14, it says, it says that there should only be one person talking at a time. That's a Bible principle. That's a Bible principle. There's nothing wrong with ladies talking in church. I mean, our, our sister up here, our, 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 uh, our elder's wife, she said, glory to God. And I said, say it again, sister. There's nothing wrong with ladies talking in church. It's just there's a time to talk and there's a time where it's a distraction. 
Not just to the person you're talking to, unless it's your child. I said, okay, then that's okay. And so the Bible says, and if your wife has a question, tell me what it says. Ask him at home. That's what your Bible says. Yeah, that's what your Bible says. And if your husband has a question like, what's for dinner today? Yeah, ask her, ask her, ask her afterwards. You're not eating now anyway. <laughs> well, I just want to be ready. No, 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 you're already ready. That's why you're asking. And it says if there's two people prophesying, that's why we have people come up because it's decent and orderly. We have people come up if they have a prophecy or a tongue or an interpretation. I've had people come and they sit through several services and they say, well, you must not believe in gifts of the Spirit. Believe in every one of them. All nine of them. They manifest any time the Lord chooses. He's the boss. He's in charge. We're not. But we have, a, have them come up and speak into a microphone, number one, so everybody can hear them. A vocal gift. That's to be heard. So, so, so yeah. Number two, so we have a record of it. Have a recording of it. And number three, so that there's not one person prophesying over here while another person is speaking in tongues over here while another person's trying to hear so they can give the interpretation over here and another person's prophesying over here. And the Bible said that would be out of order one at a time. And then let the first hold their peace. Know what that means? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so there's a verse in our Bible that says, do everything without distraction. Distraction. So your pastor just ministered to you for about a little less than 10 minutes on not being a distraction. Not being a distraction. Okay? That all right? Okay. Praise the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Where did you turn in your Bible? Where? Mark chapter 6. Pastor, what if it's an emergency? Listen, we don't want any emergencies to happen in the sanctuary. It's an emergency. Go. And he went out from there. And he went out from there. Now, Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 5 is a tremendous chapter. Jesus casts out a devil. Remember that? I mean, in the pigs and that whole thing. And then, and, 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 and then, then he gets an invitation to somebody's house. Jairus, ruler of the synagogue, Jairus by name, come to my house, my little daughter's sick, lying at the point of death. And you know what Jesus didn't say? Jesus didn't say, well, it's not God's will to heal her. Jesus didn't even have to stop and pray. He said, let's go take care of the girl. And on the way there, then a woman who's been 12 years issuing blood, terrible physical condition, getting weaker and weaker, spent everything she had, totally broke, and she heard of Jesus, and she, she snuck in that crowd. I said, she snuck in. Sometimes you have to sneak in if you want to get anything from God. You got to get in, you got to get in between people. You got, to, you got to push your way through the crowd. And she grabbed the hem of his garment and she was totally healed. Totally healed. And, and then they came to Jairus and they said, Trouble not the master, your little daughter is dead. That's human thinking. It's too late. There was a chance while well, she still had breath in her lungs, but, but trouble not the master. And Jesus turned, can't you imagine him just locking eyes on that man and saying, fear not, only believe. And he went to his house and raised that little girl from the dead. I just thought I'd lay the groundwork for verse 1. It says, and he went out from there. And he went out from there. Now there, he cast devils out of people, the whole legion. And there, he raised a little girl from the dead. And there, power went out of him and healed a woman who had tried everything and everybody before that. But he went out from there. Read that. And he came into his... Come on, help me preach today. He came to his, he came to his own country. Your own country is where everybody knows you. Everybody knows your name. It's where you grew up, where you played wiffle ball with all the boys in the back alley. It's where you went to school. Everybody knew him in his own country, but no one knew him there where he'd been before. But he came out of there, and he came to his own country, and his disciples followed with him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. What did he begin to do? 
teach. That was one-third of his ministry. According to the book of Matthew, twice it gives us scriptures in chapter 4 and chapter 9 on the twofold, excuse me, the threefold ministry of Jesus, teaching, preaching, and healing. The threefold ministry of Jesus while he was here on the earth. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in their synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished. And they said, from whence or where has this man all of this wisdom? Where did this man gain all of this wisdom? That's what they said. That's what they asked. Where has this wisdom come from? What wisdom is this which is given to him? And even such mighty works are worked by his hands. Now, he hadn't done any mighty works there. The mighty works were done where he came from. He came from there. There, he cast out demons. There, he healed people. There, he raised the dead. But he came to his own town. He began to teach. And they were astonished. Say it. Uh, they were astonished at his wisdom. And even these mighty works, which are worked by his hands. So they acknowledged it, didn't they? They acknowledged his wisdom. They acknowledged the mighty works. But then the very next verse, then they said this. Is not this the carpenter? The son of Mary, brother of James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And we'll just go on and teach. Verse 4, Jesus said, A prophet is only without honor, not given honor, in his own country and among his own relatives and in his own home. And he could... Wow, what a powerful word. It didn't say he wouldn't. It says he couldn't. And he could there do no mighty work. We know he did mighty works before this in chapter 4, we, we, chapter 3, and chapter 4, and chapter 5. Uh, we know he did mighty works there, but here he could do no mighty work, save he laid his hands on a few sick folk, the Weymouth translation says sickly folk, people with minor ailments, and maybe, a, maybe a sinus cold, maybe just, a, just something minor. Not, nothing, no, certainly nobody raised from the dead. Certainly nobody, nobody healed of anything major. He, he healed a few sick folk and, and laid his hands on them and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. He marveled because of their unbelief. Let's get my whiteboard up here. He marveled because of their because of their unbelief. What did he marvel because of? Unbelief. Only two things ever caused Jesus to marvel. What were they? Great faith. He marvels at great faith, and he marvels at unbelief. He just marveled because of their unbelief. And, 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 and as the Lord had me, woke me up one morning, and, 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 and had me focusing on these verses in Mark chapter 6, for the very purpose, for the very purpose of coming to share it with you today. These people, these people, they, they were in a quandary. You ever been in a quandary? You ever, you ever been, Moses had to stand up and says, how long will you halt between two opinions? You ever been between two opinions? That's where they were. They were being pulled one way and they were being pulled the other way. They were being pulled in two directions. In one direction, they saw his wisdom. They heard about his mighty works. And, and they actually acknowledged that they took place. And they acknowledged that this was great wisdom that had been given to him. But on the other hand, they're being pulled over in this direction. And that is, but he was raised here. We know him. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. We know his family. We know his mama. We know his name. We know we, he's a carpenter. We know where he works. We know what he does. And they were pulled in these two directions, and this direction over here got them. And they said, we're not going to believe anything, and, 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 and this is it, because we can't figure it out. If I can't, if I don't, if I can't comprehend it, if it's not logical to me, Nobody that grew up in our hometown can have that much wisdom. Nobody that I went to school with can have that much of God's power in their life. 
Don't tell me that that person is called of God and the hand of God is upon them and they speak on behalf of the living God and they raise the dead. Yeah, right. If they did that, let's see them do it here. And they're having this this mental game, this mental warfare that they're not going to accept who he is and what he's done, even though they can hear it themselves and even though they can they, they, they can acknowledge it. Uh, they're not going to do that because they can't rationalize between wisdom and mighty works. And he's a carpenter, and he's Mary's son, and he's these guys' brother, and he grew up here. And they're they're looking at two things: they're looking at spiritual and natural. Yeah. Wednesday night we're going to look at. The spiritual and the natural in a, in, a, in a completely different sense. But that's what's, that's what's tearing at these people right here. They could have been like anybody else. They could have been like everywhere else the Lord went, because everywhere else the Lord went, He taught, He preached, He healed, He cast out devils, He raised the dead, He opened blind eyes, He unstopped deaf ears, the mute spoke, the the lepers were cleansed, the lame jumped and ran and walked, and the dead were raised, but not here. Here, they let something they could perceive naturally rob them of what the Lord wanted them to have supernaturally. And if you're not careful, you and I can do the same thing. If you're not careful, you and I can fall into the same trap that, well, if it's not rational, if it's not logical, if I can't make sense of it, how about this? If I can't wrap my brain around it, then I'm going to have to pause, step back, think about it a little more until I can actually make sense of it. Now, the problem with that is that you and I live in the sense realm. That's the way God created us. You have five physical senses, and, and every, I, I believe that speaker is there. I believe that speaker is there. I believe that speaker is there. Why? Because I can see it. Uh, I can touch it. I don't want to taste it, but that, that's, 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 okay, that, that's one of your five physical senses. And you, you can taste it, you can see it, you can smell it, you can touch it or handle it, or you can hear it. That's the way you contact everything in this realm that, excuse me, we're incarcerated in. We're in this realm, and I'll believe it if I can see it. Who said that? John chapter 20, if you'd like to study it later, that's what Judas, excuse me, Thomas said. That's what Thomas said. Thomas said, he came, and the other said, Jesus is risen from the dead. And Thomas said, I'm not going to believe that until I see with my eyes the holes in his hand, until I touch with my finger the holes in his hand, until I take my hand and thrust it up in that great spear wound in his side, I will not believe. Now, as soon as you can show it to me so that it makes sense to me, then I'll believe it. Then I'll accept it. Then I'll receive it. John chapter 20, what happened? The next Sunday morning, they were all gathered together again. Thomas was sitting there going, "Uh uh-huh, come on, let's see it. Right, what happened? Jesus just, right there, there he was. Didn't knock, just came in. And he was standing there. Jesus is always there when believers gather together. Whether you see him or not. He walks in the midst of the churches, searching the reins of the heart. And Jesus came and stood right there in their midst. And the first person he talked to was Thomas and said, Behold, that means look at, my hands, and come near and thrust your finger in there and your hand up in my side and quit being faithless and start believing. And, and, And Thomas, man, he hit the dirt. Remember that? Fell right on his knees and said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus, I suppose he expected to be commended. Jesus didn't commend him. Jesus said, the only reason you believe is because you've seen me. More blessed are they which believe and have never seen me. Why? Because faith pleases God. 
Not what you can contact with your senses, not what makes sense to you, not what is rational and logical, and you can wrap your puny little brain around, and, and, and okay, as long as I can figure it out, Pastor, then I'm going to believe it. If you can show me that it makes sense, then I'm going to accept it. But Jesus came to his own people, and he preached there, and they marveled, and they said, wisdom and mighty works, but, he's, but he's, it just doesn't compute. It doesn't make sense. He's not God. He, come on. Come on. He's, he, we play ball together. I watched him grow up. I've known him since he was three. We were in daycare. We played in his yard. He played in ours. Remember when he, remember when he, 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 he jammed his thumb there sliding into third? You no, know, they just they knew all of those things, and that robbed them of him doing any mighty work, him doing any miracle in their midst. And they struggled with, it just doesn't make sense to us. And we're not going to accept it, we're not going to receive it, until you can make sense of it. Listen, uh, uh, Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15, look at it up here on the screen with me. Colossians 1.15 tells you that you're not going to make sense of God. Jesus Christ is speaking of in 13 and 14. It says he's, he's the image of the invisible God. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. How are you going to contact God with your five physical senses when he's invisible? I'll believe in the Holy Spirit when you show him to me. No, you, you believe in the Holy Spirit or he'll never show him to you. In the world, we hear it all the time, seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. But in the Bible, believing is seeing. Right. It's completely opposite. Yeah. It says in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, believe that you receive, and then you'll see. And then you'll see. Mary, Mary, mother of the Christ child, she was told, blessed is she that believes. Now there shall be a performance of those things that were told her. Yeah. See, you believe it first, and then you see it. You believe it first, and then you see it. Not the other way around. In, in, in our Bibles, in, in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, we read that without faith it is impossible to please God. For whosoever cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I'll believe it when he shows it to me. I'll believe, no, that's, that's all sense knowledge. And that's not faith. It's based on what you see, what you feel, what makes sense to you, what's logical. And if it doesn't make sense, I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to accept it. I'm not going to receive it. I'm not going to be open to it because it doesn't make sense. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 says we walk by F-A-I-T-H, not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. Faith is based on what God said and what God said alone. Amen. Romans 10, 17, faith cometh only one way. There's not two and there's not ten. There's not a dozen. No, there's only one way faith comes. Faith is based on what God said. Faith is based on your word. So let's bring this together. What does the Bible say that you yet have to have proven to you before you'll believe it? What does the Bible declare? What does the Bible communicate? What does the Word of God say in written form from God Himself that you are yet waiting to see, waiting to have proven to you? It doesn't make sense. It's not rational. It's not logical. I can't wrap my brain around it. If you're waiting for that, you haven't pleased God yet. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And as long as I'm standing back like Thomas and saying, until I see it, I won't believe it. I mean, I know that's what it says in the Bible, but, but come on, pastor. Come on, pastor. No, no, no. Come on, you. <laughs> in Numbers chapter 16, here's Moses. <clears throat> Moses is called of God. Now, who doesn't, who's the first person that doesn't believe Moses is called of God? Not Pharaoh, no, no, the Israelites. They don't believe he comes, he comes on God's behalf. 
They don't believe that. He's, he's got to go through them first. Then he's got to go to Pharaoh, who doesn't believe it, even though he throws his stick down, even though there's lice and, and locusts and blood and flies and frogs and the sun going dark and, and hail and, and all those things. He still doesn't believe. He doesn't believe. He lets him go just out of sorrow and sadness because his firstborn is dead. He doesn't say, your God is God. That's on the Charlton Heston movie. That's not in your Bible. And then he, and then he chases him out of there. No, no. All, all, the, all the while they were in the wilderness. Those, the people of God, God's chosen people, they contended with Moses the whole time they were out there. And in Numbers chapter 16, you know what they said? This is what they said. They came and said, we don't believe God has spoken to you. That's what they said. They said, we don't believe God has spoken to you. And we don't believe God has called you. You know, now, you know why they didn't believe God had spoken to Moses? This isn't difficult. Why did they believe that God hadn't spoken to Moses? You know Why? Because he never had spoken to them. God didn't speak to them. Not even one time did they hear the voice of God. They depended on Moses to hear the voice of God and bring the word of God to them. And then finally one day they said, we don't believe God spoke to you. <laughs> Moses said, is that right? <laughs> We're going to find out tomorrow who he spoke to and who he didn't. You get on that side, I'll get on this side. I'll make sure I'm far enough away because the, the whole desert's going to open up and, and swallow them right down. And he told them ahead of time. Told them ahead of time. If they die the death of normal mortal <laughs> men, God has not spoken to me, nor through me, nor chosen me, nor called me. But if the earth opens underneath them and swallows them alive into hell, then God has spoken by me. Okay, you want a confirmation, you say. What's written in your Bible? And the earth opens. The next day, they stand out there defiantly, and the earth opens, and every one of them and their families, everything that appertains to them, that means all their possessions and everything, go right down in a hole in the desert. And, of course, there are people who say, well, <laughs> this has to make sense up here, or I don't believe it happened. Maybe there was an earthquake. And they just happened to be standing right there on the fault line. I don't know if you ever, ever have the, the un unfortunate experience to watch some of these kind of things. Uh, uh, some of the cable channels they'll have. And somebody's going to have a whole program about something that happened in the Bible, about the Red Sea opening up and splitting. You remember Exodus 14, 15? The ocean parted. And they're going to explain how it happened going to explain it. Because somebody took their Bible and they read something in their Bible and, and I want to help you this morning that you never, ever, 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 ever fall back into that. Amen. And they read in their Bible that Moses led two million people out of slavery and took the, and, and there was an ocean in front of them and held out his stick. And God blew his nose. Oh yeah, it says the breath of his nostril and the whole ocean parted up and they all walked across dry shot, dry land. Now why should that be such a difficult thing for you to think that God could do? There's nothing impossible with our God. The angel stood there before Mary and said, nothing is impossible with God. Impossible only exists in the sense realm. Impossible only exists among humans. Impossible only exists where there's a limit on the ability. There is no limit on God's ability. And, 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 and he, said, he, said, he said, move forward. Hold your rod, hold your staff out. And the, and the ocean went, went up one way and up the other way. And these people get on these programs. Oh, I can't watch them. I can't watch them. I scream at the TV. I don't yell. I scream at the TV. Don't I, Paul? Hush. I just... <laughs> Huh? I, I, I just can't take it. 
Because why should it seem like a difficult thing, let alone an impossible thing, that God parts the ocean and lets his people walk through? And what they are doing when they run these programs and get on the internet and the World Wide Web and try to explain away all of the supernatural in your Bible, just like those people explained away the deity of God's Son by saying, but he was born here, we know his last name, we know his family, he was, he was raised here, he's a carpenter. How can he be God? He, 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 he makes knick-knack shelves. <laughs> Instead of humbly bowing themselves and saying, I believe that you, Lord Jesus, you're the Christ, son of the living God. But the one person who did said, say that, Jesus said, that's the, that's the revelation that this entire kingdom will be built on. That's the Petra that this entire kingdom will be built on. The revelation that you are the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah, the one that was sent. They didn't believe that because there was just too many natural things that didn't line up. And it didn't make sense. And so, so they come up with a real great explanation, and it usually has something to do with the depth of the water. Well, you know, we go to that place where we believe they crossed, and there's grass sticking right up out of the water. And the water's only ankle deep in that place where they crossed. And so the wind blew from the east, and, and it does that. It just kind of blows all the water. And you can actually see the sand, and you can walk all the way across at that place. That's such a great logical description about how two million people walked across the Red Sea. But they forget that the next verse says that Pharaoh and 600 chariots and all of his army tried to pursue after the Israelites and the sea closed upon them and drowned them all. How do you drown a horse in that much water? Chariots, horses, and, and, and all of his army, everybody! God said, God said to the Israelites, oh, you're going to go across dry and you'll never, ever see this army again. Hallelujah. Ever. I mean, he, he could have done like he, he did with Elijah. Remember Elijah? He outran the king's chariot. And people, they'll get on that, dumb, on that TV program, <laughs> and then they'll say, well, he knew a shortcut. <laughs> because the chariot had to go down the road, which was over this way, and all the way around here, and all the way over here, and he just ran down the mountain. Oh. I've been on that mountain. I've looked across the plains of Jezreel 21 miles. And the king took off when he came down from prayer. And he said, saddle up your horses, king. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. You better get going. And then it says, he cinched his belt up and the hand of God came on him. And he outran the king's chariot. So he was standing like this when the king got to the town. That's what it said. He met him at the gate. He was there at the gate before the king ever arrived. And, but they have to find some way to, to make it logical. Right? Creation. How many people have you, have you, well, God couldn't do that in six days. God could do that in six seconds. God is God, and in your feeble human brain that by design is limited, by design it takes faith to believe in God. It takes faith to believe His Word. It takes faith to say, if it says it, I believe it. That settles it. It's settled in eternity, and it's settled in my life. And if I can't figure it out, if I can't wrap my little peanut brain around it, if I can't, it's not logical and rational, and I can't, I can't figure out how to explain it, then all I have to do is just receive it and believe it, not argue with it, not contend with it, and not believe these people right here. Not believe these people right here. The critics. The mockers. The cynics. Cynical. Cynicism. And the doubters. Say it. I am not one of these. No, but they exist. And they mock your Bible. And they're critics. And they're cynical about everything that's in it. And it'll hurt your life if you listen even one time to any of them. It'll limit the power of God just like it did to those people when the Lord Jesus Christ Himself was standing right there in their midst. God couldn't do what in six days? 
Well, there's that story about the boat. No, it's an ark. Get it right. <laughs> and it says it took 100 years to build. Come on. They didn't have just, and they, and, they, and they just began to question everything about what the Bible said. They have no evidence. They have no, no, no evidence whatsoever that they didn't have tools. And, and you expect me to believe that God made all the animals come two by two. Well, not all. Read the rest of the Bible. It talks about the clean beasts and the unclean beasts and the ones for food and the ones for sacrifice. And was, well, you just can't convince me. I get that. I'm not trying. Not my job is to, your job is not to convince people that the Bible is true. Their job is to believe the Bible is true and then it will open up to them and God will reveal it to them in the depth of truth as they continue to walk with Him. But as long as they struggle and wrestle and ask you for explanations and you get baited into that and drawn into that and things that can't be explained, shouldn't be explained, were never meant to be explained, they were meant to be believed. I got some other fav- fav- favorites here. I, 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 I was. Anybody here in the air flip channels? Because there's nothing on to watch. And then I see this good program about the pillar of fire that, 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 that God put between the Israelites and, and, and the Egyptians. Remember the story? Pharaoh's so fed up with them, he says, just go, just go. And they go down by the banks of the Red Sea you know, before the wind blew the ankle-deep water. <laughs> and they camped there that night. And it said Pharaoh's army chased him, came upon them. And God, in a pillar of fire, stood between them and their enemies. That ought to encourage you. I said, that ought to just encourage you. Pillar of fire. How wide of a pillar of fire does it take to stand between an army and two million people? And this program said... They had lanterns on sticks. <laughs> I'm just one guy, and a lantern on a stick wouldn't scare me. How about you? A lantern on a stick. That's your expl- That's the best you can do? I think I'll stick with just faith. I think I'll just stick with, I, I, I just believe what the Word of God says. But they struggle with, they struggle with the, the pillar of fire. They struggle with manna. How else do you explain that that many people lived for 40 years without a grocery store? And every morning, the Bible says that, that there, were, there was manna all over the ground. Every morning. Well, pastor, you don't really believe that that happened, do you? No, I know it did. No, I know it did. The Bible says so. And, and, and water come out of a rock. Oh, they got this great explanation. There, there, was, a, there was a mountain, and, and there's underwater aquifers. Well, there probably are. There are all around us. Springs coming up out of the hills and off the ridges, all over. Well, the water just forced its way up. It was really no miracle. They just constantly are trying. Maybe you don't listen to them. Good. Maybe you pay no attention to them. Very good. But they're constantly attacking the veracity and the validity of, and, and, the, and, and the absolute certain truth of your Bible by saying, well, well, we can explain that one. You're missing something here. They carried the rock around with them. The Bible says it followed that they put it on a car. It went everywhere they went. Pretty big cart if you can put a whole mountain on it. Speaking of water, how about Peter walking on it? It's hilarious to listen to some of these people. Some of the mockers and critics and doubters and idiots and, 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 and <laughs> that, 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 well, we know how it happened. We know what happened. Because in the Sea of Galilee, no, 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 I've been on that sea. I've been on that sea. Yeah, but there are like these beds of weeds and you can actually, they, they float and you can actually stand on them and step on them. And if you step off, you begin to sink and that explains the whole thing. I don't understand it. What the need is to, to, just, to just totally disregard what the Word of God says about the miraculous. The realm in which God exists and the realm in which you and I can joyfully live. 
Here's my favorite. This is my favorite one of all. There's a whole book in the Bible devoted to this, only four chapters. Old Testament, book of Jonah. Remember this one? Jonah's this minister, and he's called to go down and preach to people. And, and, and he doesn't want to go there because he don't like those people. You probably have a neighbor or two you don't want to witness to, Jonah. Maybe you've got a worker. Maybe you've got a relative. You're Jonah. Yeah, God said, go witness to him because I care about him. You might not care about him, but I do. And I love him. You might not love him, but I do. And I want you to go witness to him. Well, I'm not going to go witness to him. You know what they said to me last time. Listen, Jonah, go or you might get swallowed by a fish. A very big fish. Yeah, Jonah got on a boat and he sailed the other direction. He didn't want to go. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't like those people. They were enemies. They were enemies. God loves your enemies. You ought to. The Bible tells you to. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use and persecute you. Don't turn your back on them and walk away. Jonah got on a ship, went the other way. The storm would have sunk that ship in the bottom. He finally got up and he said, it's me. I'm the reason. I'm the cause. Throw me overboard and the, and the, and the storm will cease. I'm out of the will of God. There's no more miserable person to be around on the whole planet. No, not, not, a, not an unsaved person, not, not a heathen, not a pagan. Most of them are happy. When you got God dealing with you and God convicting you and God, that's the most miserable person you can be around. Out of the will of God. Know it, know it, and fighting it. Fighting it. Just throw me overboard. So all those men got together and they prayed to God. They said, we don't believe in you, but we're going to talk to you. And they said, we're pitching this guy over. Please don't hold it against us. He told us to. So they pitched him over the side. He never even hit the water. God had prepared a very big fish and, 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 and swallowed him. Now, Pastor Clements. I'll probably get some letters, emails, notes. They won't be birthday cards. They'll just be cards. <laughs> you cannot possibly believe. Oh, yes, I can. Amen. Because if it says it in that book, I am resigned to believing everything that's in this book, whether I can figure it out, whether I can... can, can can explain it, whether it's rational and logical, whether my little peanut-sized brain can actually wrap around it. I'm just going to believe what it says. That is the determination and decision that I've personally made, and, 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 and I challenge you today, if you haven't, to make. He was thrown off the side of that boat and a big fish. I used to read the same book to my daughter every night. It was her favorite. She'd giggle when I got to that part, that dark, smelly belly of the very big fish. <laughs> How'd you like to be in the dark, smelly belly of the very big fish? You better witness to your enemies or, or you never know what might happen. He was down there. It was all a shadow and a type of Jesus going in the darkest hole of the earth. It says seaweed was wrapped around his head in there. That's the crown of thorns. And after three days and three nights, and Jesus stood when he said, like Jonah was in the in, in the. Uh, the dark smelly belly, uh, for three days, uh, I will be in the belly of the earth. That's what he said. And just like that, that big fish belched him up, hell is going to belch me out of there. It can't hold me. Glory to God. And, and, oh, you can't possibly believe that. How would he breathe? How would I know? Well, how, why, would I, why would I care? How would he breathe? You don't believe the Bible because you can't hold your breath very long. Well, that's a great reason to be a doubter and a mocker and a critic of God's Word. Well, he couldn't have held his breath for three days and nights. How do you know? But you, in your mind, have to get all the little boxes checked and everything has to make sense or you're not going to believe what it says. Listen, there are some of us that don't only believe that, that we believe the Bible says the big fish swallowed Jonah. We'd believe it if it said that Jonah swallowed the big fish. <laughs> the Bible says that Philip was over there preaching and, 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 and he met that Ethiopian and he got him saved and sent him back to Africa and he was translated. The Spirit of God caught him away and he was right into, and I guess they didn't have American Airlines. And he was there. Well, you don't believe that really. I believe every word of it. And I believe that's exactly the way it happened. And everybody that was healed in the Bible. And everybody that was resurrected in the Bible. Well, you know, it is possible that uh, Lazarus was just asleep. <laughs> oh, 
Now, I don't want to get into your personal life, but how many people stink when they sleep? No, not that kind of stink. No, no, no. No, I, I, I mean the stink, the stench of decomposition. There's nothing else in the whole world that smells like a decaying human body. Not an animal of any kind. We can't take that stone off. By this time, he stinks. See? Their mind got in the way. They nearly missed a great miracle to see their brother resurrected from the dead because they didn't want to smell it. He already told them, your brother's going to rise again. And you know what they said? Mental, get into it again. We know he will on the day of the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. Now roll that stone away. Well, Jesus, and so this is most people, this is most people. So it's okay to be a little religious, but don't get beside yourself. You know, it's okay to wave your hands. It's okay to, 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 to tremble a little bit. Do you believe God? Well, hallelujah, Pastor, that's not what I ask you. Do you believe God? You believe He'll do it? You believe He'll do it now? And roll that stone away. And they rolled it away. Lazarus, come forth. And here he come. All wrapped up in grave clothes. Just like every other person has ever been saved, ever been born again, ever became a Christian. Still got all those stinky clothes on and needs some other Christians to help them. Not, not criticize them. Not look down on them. Not, 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 not judge them. No. He said, he said, now loose him. Now get all those stinky grave clothes off him and get him away from him and let him go. And let him go. Right amongst our ranks. Oh, well, Pastor, we don't believe in the rapture. I mean, the catching away, the, you know, the last trumpet sounds like six of them already have, and the seventh trumpet is about to blast. And, and, and we just can't figure out what will happen to all those automobiles when that happens. <laughs> What about my plants? Oh, mercy. Oh, mercy. My goldfish. What, what about the automatic rollover in my 401k? <laughs> What's going to happen if the plane is being piloted by... These are reasons you don't believe what the Bible says about the catching away and gathering away in the twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ will rise first. Yeah, but pastor, now that you brought that up, I mean, those people are decayed and it's all gone and it's all dust and, and the dunes of sand have blown away. And all, I, mean, I mean, God's got to have something to start with. And there's nothing left. No, 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 no. No, you, you read in your Bible that he created everything that is out of nothing. Hebrews chapter 11. He created what already is out of nothing. Your God doesn't need anything. Art, I'm not quite done yet. Is that all right? I, I heard it recently. I, I didn't know there was. I, I don't, I'm not sure I'm glad I know. But uh, that there's a controversy about Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. It says, and an angel descended down from heaven with a great chain in his hand. I, I watched this. I watched a whole council of ministers sit at a big meeting called for this purpose to argue as to whether or not there's a chain that could hold a spirit. <laughs> if they invite me, just write back and say he has a lot better things to do with his time. If the Bible says an angel descended from heaven with a great chain in his hand and chained him up and threw him in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years, I think I'm done thinking about it. That's what's going to happen. 
That is what is going to happen. Amen. 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 And then, and then, and then another of my favorites. I have lots of favorites. There was a man thrown in a fiery furnace. He had two friends thrown in the fiery furnace. And, and all of the explanation, well, you know, there was probably one corner where it wasn't very hot. It burned up the soldiers that threw them in. They all became crispy critters just by leaning over the top. It killed them all. And these men went down in with ropes on their hands. And the king stood up and said, I can't wrap my brain around this. This doesn't make sense. This is not logical. This is, he grabbed his, he said, how many did we throw in there? And they said, we threw three in there. And they were, and they were all tied up and bound. He said, well, I see four walking around loose, walking around loose, walking around. And the fourth looks to me like the son of God. Do you believe that really happened? I believe every word of it. I believe that's exactly the way it happened. That's exactly, just exactly like the Bible says it happened. That's the way it happened. And then how about this one? There's this great walled city. Well, they had to walk around just in this certain order, and then the harmonic tunes of the ground started, and there was this earthquake. It's just mind-boggling that people can believe their own explanations of what they don't believe. I said it's mind-boggling to me to try to hear people explain why they don't believe what they don't believe. The Lord said, walk around that city six times. And don't say a word the whole time you walk. Matter of fact, don't even open your mouth until I tell you to. And then the seventh day, walk around just seven times. And then blow the trumpets and shout. I've watched a number of sporting events. I think the, the, the biggest crowd I ever watched was 106,000 people. And I watch them all at the top of their voice shout, and nothing falls down. Nothing falls down. Nothing. The Bible says the walls fell down flat. Pushed right down into the ground. Flat. And the Israelites, all of them, went straight forward before them, right into the town. Except for one little section of the wall. Wrap your brain around this. There's one person in there who honored God and who helped the people of God and, and hung the scarlet thread out the window and her little section stood. The rest of the wall is all gone and she's up there with, and the Bible says this, and all that you can get into your house will be saved too. Get people close to you for no other reason than get them saved. Introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. No, no, the Bible says what it does about creation, about Noah, about the Red Sea, about the pillar of fire, about manna, about water from the rock, about Peter walking on the water, about Jonah, the rapture, the chain that will bind Satan, Daniel, the three Hebrew boys, Jericho, David and Goliath, and (coughs) the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet we hear there's a controversy today about whether or not Jesus was resurrected or whether he just passed out. Whether he was just resuscitated. Turn over to the book of Acts. Turn and look at the book of Acts with me. Should we go to one other scripture? Yeah. Wasn't it just last week that, that I preached out of 2 Kings? Was it two weeks ago? Last week, I, I was there. 2 Kings chapter 7. Remember in 2 Kings chapter 7? Remember what this man said? Elijah the prophet stood up there and he said, King! I'm going to speak by the word of the Lord right now. There's a famine in your land. You can't buy a sack of flour if you had a thousand dollars. There isn't one. There isn't any. You can't buy a bushel of barley if you had ten million dollars. There isn't any. But he said, tomorrow at this time, you'll be able to buy a bushel of flour for 88 cents. 
and a bushel of barley for 60. And the man on whose arm the king leaned stood and said, You're crazy, man of God. If the heavens themselves would open up and pour out of heaven, that could never come to pass. There's a lot of people like that. There's a lot of people who hear the word of the Lord and they doubt it. Because they can't, they can't, in their wildest imaginations, they can't figure out how that could ever happen. There are people that, that they, they go to churches and they hear, bring all your tithes into the storehouse and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, and see if I'll not open the windows of heaven above you and pour out more than you can contain. And, and they, well, they just can't figure out how that happened. Because they look at their bills and they look at their lack and they look at not enough and, and, and they won't just believe God. They won't just take Him at His word. Believe you receive and you shall have. Well, yeah, but. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and that door will be opened to you. Well, but I, but, but, but you know, I, I tried that one time and I'm thinking back. And, 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 and before you know it, I'm a doubter. Or I know somebody who tried that stuff, and here's what happened to them. What's that got to do with me? Right. Right. Nothing to do with me. That man looked at Elijah and said, if the heavens themselves would open and God would pour out, this could never come to pass. He couldn't figure it out. Elijah looked back at him and said, not only will it come to pass, but it will come to pass and you will never take one mouthful of it. You'll never enjoy it. Now, how's that going to come to pass? Well, the next day, those three lepers sitting by the gate said, what are we doing sitting here? Might as well go try something. Sit here till we die. And they got up and they went to the Syrians camp and, the Syri and God made it sound like armies coming at them. And all the Syrians fled. They walked in there, gold, silver, clothes, food, pots still on the fire, surplus. I mean, they had come preparing to lay siege to the city for years. The Romans surrounded that city, and they encamped around it for over two years and never left to starve everybody out. They came prepared. Those lepers, they went from tent to tent. What do they got in that? Oh, chicken stew. We'll have some of that. What they got in the next one? Oh, tamales. This is really great. Oh, what are we going to the next one? Spaghetti and meatballs. Hallelujah. Let's sit down and try some of that. Praise God. Omelets. Come on over here, guys. And then they said, this isn't right. We need to go back and tell everybody. And they went back and told everybody. And the king said, I don't believe it, but send a couple horses anyway, the ones we didn't eat. There's a couple of them left. Send those over there. And they came back and said, it's just like they said. What the man should have said is, it's just like Elijah said. Elisha, the prophet, the spokesman of God, told us it would be this way. And the whole city went out there except for one man. That man on whose arm the king leaned, he held the gate. And the crowd squeezing through the gate knocked him over and trampled him to death. And he died right there in the gate. Everybody else ate. And a measure of wheat was sold for 88 cents and a bushel of barley for 60. But he didn't eat of it. Listen, God watches over His Word to perform it, not my ability to understand it. He doesn't care if I can understand it. He said it, that settles it. Not God said it, I believe it, that settles it. God said it, that settles it. Therefore, I believe it. I believe it. Paul is, 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 is he's before King Agrippa in, in Acts chapter 26. And he's speaking to him. And, and he's, he's telling him about the resurrection from the dead. And now let me find it here. Now let's just start with verse 1. Paul said, Agrippa said to Paul, the king said, you're permitted to speak for yourself. And Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. He said, I think myself happy. I underlined that in my Bible. 
I've got that highlighted in my Bible. I don't think myself sad. I don't think myself broke. I don't think myself sick. I don't think myself lower than others. I think myself happy. King Agrippa, because I'll answer for myself this day <clears throat> concerning the things whereof I'm accused of the Jews, especially because I know you are an expert in all the customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech you, hear me patiently, my manner of life from my youth, which was first of my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion I lived, a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God to our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, this is the resurrection of the dead, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible? The margin of my Bible says that's the word impossible. Why should it be thought impossible with you that God should raise the dead? You ought to underline that, highlight that, maybe make a couple copies of that. And just ask yourself, what do I think is impossible with God? Maybe hear the apostles' words resonate across time to say to you, why should it be an impossible thing to you that you should be healed of this condition, that you should come out of poverty into blessing so that you can be a blessing? Why should it be an impossible thing to you that, that this could be restored, that this could be brought to life, that this prayer could be answered, that this dream could be realized? Why such an impossible? Why would it be impossible for you to think that God would raise the dead? See, the Pharisees claimed to believe in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't. But the Pharisees believed in it, but they didn't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. They didn't really believe in it. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Because a man was raised right from the grave, raised from the dead, but they didn't believe it. Why should it be an incredible thing to you that God would answer prayer? Here, I, I, I got a birthday card. I got a birthday card. Looking around to see if, if she's here and I don't see her. So, I'll read it anyway. She'll have to listen from afar. <clears throat> Happy birthday, Pastor. I love this next line. For your birthday, I'm going to talk about me. <laughs> you know this is your mama, right? It's seven degrees outside. The wind finally died down, so it's a perfect time for a brisk walk and to watch the sunrise over the horizon and praise God for his goodness. As you can understand, winter's a season when a farmer has time, which for me means time to take morning walks, something I haven't been able to do for the past two years. I was reminiscing. Last year in January, I was getting around the house with a walker. Arthur showed up the year before. That's arthritis. Arthur showed up the year before in my knees. After all, my parents suffered with arthritis, so it would be expected that I would too. The muscles in my left leg had seized up. I was sure the demon that jumped off Sean's back hopped onto my leg. I spent the spring dragging my left leg around, walking up and down stairs like a toddler, eating Tylenol and ibuprofen like M&Ms. After tax season, I saw a knee doctor. He gave me a prescription that was literally killing me. I remember one afternoon after hauling milk, my face, shoulder, arms going numb. What was I to do? Fast forward to October 14. Through Dr. Barclay, the Lord rebuked arthritis, the spirit of infirmity out of my knees. I took it. Wouldn't you know, it was the same time period my pastor was preaching on spiritual warfare. I spent a lot of time yelling at Arthur. He kept trying to come back. I did what my pastor told me to do. Today I went for a walk at 7. No pain in my knees, no creaking, no snapping when I walk. Healed and whole, praise God. Healed and whole, praise God. I thank God for leaders that he's put in my life to help me and teach me. Happy birthday, Rhonda Rock. Come on, clap real big, praise God. Clap real big. Stand to your feet and keep clapping.
Why should it seem a thing impossible to you for God to answer prayer, for God to heal the sick, for God to stop the sun in the sky for three hours because a man of God prayed, for God to multiply five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000 people and have 12 baskets left over and then have somebody say, well, the loaves of bread were bigger back then. How big do they have to be? You fed five, see, see, if you take the miraculous away from God, you take away God. If you take the miraculous out of the word of God, you take the word of God away. The new birth is miraculous. The grace of God to draw you to himself is miraculous. The, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is miraculous. Deliverance is miraculous. Every day we rise up and breathe and serve God and worship him and he hears our prayers. That's miraculous. Every, why should it be a thing impossible to you that God would do what he says he'll do in his word? Now I've got one scripture. We're not done. Alfred, right? Come, let me pray with you. Stretch your hands out here. Why would it seem a difficult or challenging thing with us that, that a job in cybersecurity could be provided? When our Bible says, if you ask anything in my name, if I don't have it, I'll just make it for you. I'll just make it for you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we stand in this church in agreement that Alfred gains gainful employment within the next 30 days in Jesus' name. That you answer this prayer and provide for him so he can provide for his family and set his hands to do something in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So be it. I believe it's done to you. Believe it's done. Why should it seem a difficult thing for us? You probably get it tomorrow. Believe that we receive. Now just remain standing. Remain standing and take your Bible and open it up to 2 Peter. And we'll close. 2 Peter. See, some of you thought I was going five and a half hours today, didn't you? After I said that. But listen, we've got birthday cake out here, but I got Paula's whole dinner waiting at home, so. No, I did what I was, what, what, what I was assigned to do this morning, with the exception of this one verse. Second Timothy, excuse me, Second Peter, right? Second Peter, first chapter. And Peter says, I'm going to read the rest of the chapter here, starting with verse 12. I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and you're established in the present truth. What's the present truth? The New Testament. You already know these things. You're already established in, but he said, my job as a minister is to continue to remind you, continue to put you in remembrance. It drives it deeper each and every time you hear it. I think it's proper as long as I'm in this body to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle. And he said, I'm, he's going to go to heaven. That's every man's right. Graduation day. Greatest day for a Christian. Out of the body and present at the Lord. And he said, the Lord showed me that soon I'm going to do that. Verse 15, moreover, I endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things in remembrance. There are only a limited number of things that you can remember out of life. Only a limited number. I can go back in your, your life, five years, 10 years, 15 years, and you can't even tell me what you had for lunch on August 18th of last year. Most of what takes place and happens in our life, we forget. It's not significant enough for us to remember. Make God's word. That's what he's talking about right here. Make it so significant to you and your family, your children, each other, that, that that's what you remember. I got criticized by a minister. Uh, <clears throat> we were in a small gathering, and he was telling jokes. Well, I'm, I'm not against telling jokes. I just can't remember any. I cannot truthfully before God, standing right here right now, I cannot remember one joke. And, and, and he told half a dozen different ones, and, and then somebody there looked at me and said, don't you know any jokes? 
And, and I just, I was just kind of, I drew a blank. I said, no, I, I, I don't. But I can tell you what scripture I memorized this morning. And, and, and I fired off the verse that I had memorized that morning. And I said, why don't we go around the circle here and, and everybody, everybody just share the latest verse that they memorized. You'd have thought I spit at everybody. Everybody there's a Christian. Everybody there's born again, spirit filled, a lot of members of, of my church that I pastored. And it just got quiet and everybody's head went. And that minister looked at me and said, Well, now that you got us all under condemnation. Listen, I didn't put you under condemnation. No. You were there already. <laughs> My question just showed it up. Make the Bible so significant that after my decease, I don't care if you remember what color tie I wore, what my hair looked like. Some of the, some of the things I would say, like, is that right? I mean, that's, that's cool. That's, but but well, my endeavor is that you never, ever, ever forget this. This is the most significant thing in your life. And that's what Peter said. Moreover, I endeavor that after my decease, you'll be able to have these things, these things, these things in your remembrance. For we've not followed cunningly devised fables, cleverly designed reasonings, cleverly designed myths, clever explanations. No, no, he said, we, we've not followed those. When we, made to you, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. You ought to underline eyewitnesses because that means He saw with His own eyes. Listen, He saw with His own eyes. Verse 17, For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him on the holy mountain. Remember that? Peter, James, and John. And, and they're up on, the, up on the mountain. Peter, James, John, and Jesus. And then who appears with Jesus? Moses and Elijah. And Jesus is talking to them. And Peter, like he often did, opened his mouth and said, Jesus, uh, <clears throat> Jesus, it's good to be here. You're on the mountaintop. You're watching the Lord Jesus Christ in His resurrected glory as He will be when He returns, brighter than the noonday sun. It's good to be here. And a voice comes out of the sky and says, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye Him. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And, and Peter, I, I don't know, if it, it must have been God, but he forgot that part. He didn't write that part. Like, shut up, Peter. Listen to him. Do a lot more listening than talking. And, and so he said, we were there. We were there. We heard the voice. We saw him. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. When he changed and he was brilliant and bright and glowing, it says his clothes brighter than any soap on earth could make them. And, and, and there it was, just brilliant, glistening. And, and, and he saw that. Wouldn't you like to see that? <laughs> Come on, wouldn't you like to have been a fly on the wall and just been there and watch that? And then he heard the voice of God. I mean, whenever you hear somebody say, the Lord told me, the Lord said, the Lord spoke to me, the Lord directed me, God spoke to me. You know, the vast, vast majority of the time is, 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 is in here. It's an inner witness. Or an inner voice. That wasn't, they heard the voice of God. They heard God's voice. Heard and saw. Wait, wait, wait. They heard and saw. Those are physical senses. That's the sense realm. And he said, I heard the voice of God. I, with my own eyes, witnessed the glorified, resurrected, returning Christ. And you have a more sure word of prophecy in the Bible than if you would hear or you would see 
anything you would hear and see. Verse 19 says, you have a more sure word. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I know that word is spelled B-E-B-A-I-O-T-E-R-A-S. That's what the word is spelled. And it means a more certain, more stable, more immutable, more reliable, and more dependable word. I just want to hear the Lord's voice speak to me. I wish I could have been there to watch Jericho fall. Oh, if I could have just seen Jesus heal one person, I would believe in it. No, that's what you'd see. That's what you'd hear. That's what you'd contact with your five physical senses. And you're trying to make sense of it and trying to get it to where you can accept it and understand it and explain it. And it's rational and logical to you when all you have to do is just take your Bible and say, it is a more sure, more certain, more reliable, more dependable, more stable, more immutable. And you would do well if you would take heed. You'd be blessed. You'd just be established if you would take heed. And take heed means to fix your gaze upon it and look at nothing else. As a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn, the day star rise in your heart. Knowing this first, no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private man's interpretation. One man's idea. For this prophecy came in old time by the will, not by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit himself. No, this word is more reliable. You can believe what's in your Bible. It doesn't matter what the naysayers and the doubters and the critics and the cynics, it doesn't matter what they say, it doesn't matter what they question, it doesn't matter if they can believe or if they can, you can believe everything in your Bible. Everything in your Bible. Let's take our Bibles, let's hold them up. Give me mine back. Say, this is my Bible. I believe everything that my Bible says, regardless of what the circumstances say, regardless of what the mockers and the doubters say, regardless of what the cynics and the critics say, regardless of what the devil says, I believe what the Bible says, everything that the Bible says and will fix my gaze on the more sure Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, a weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.